welcome to this one. We're going to be reading a story for. First, we're going to be reading about. First, we're going to be reading about, and then we're going to do and then we're going to be reading a story. So I hope you guys enjoy. Make sure hit. Make sure hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to in the video. Hello, how is everyone today? All right, we're on Matthew chapter 9. This is the English Standard Version. Let me get started. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil is in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me, and he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice." For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old widened skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved." While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose, and the report of this went through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But, it, but they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never has anything like this... Um, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. 
And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord for the to the Lord of the harvest, to send out lab- laborers into his harvest. That is the end of chapter 9. And next time, hopefully tomorrow, we will be reading chapter 10 from the book of Matthew. So, we are on Little Women. And so, in the last chapter, they got into a boat, they went downstream, and there was a giant waterfall, and they fell and died. And that is the end of the story. Here's Kimberly to say how it really happened. <sighs> Sorry, we just did we just did a Nile River uh, video. Documentary. Yeah, documentary. And Dad's in the river mood. <laughs> So what actually happened was they had a nice day at, um, uh, it was downriver, I believe, or maybe it was up, I don't know, and um, they had a lot of fun, they played croquet, and one of the people cheated, and they forced him to um, confess his cheating later on through a truth or dare type game, and eventually they came back. And one of them, uh, she was pretty stuck up, said, So, what's your governess like to Meg? And Meg was like, I don't have a governess. You could actually say that I am a governess, she said. And she was like, wait, you don't go to school? She's like, nope. Um, Long story short, um, she was pretty mean, and they went back um, to where where they live and I'm going to hand it off to dad who's going to read us a story. Yay, I'm back. And let me move this a little bit. And let's go ahead and get started. We're on chapter 13, Castles in the Air. Ha, <laughs> Lapida. Kimberly immediately went to Laputa. All right, there we are. Chapter 13, Castles in the Air. Lori lay luxuriously swinging to and fro in his hammock one warm September afternoon, wondering what his neighbors were about, but too lazy to go and find out. He was in one of his moods, for the day had been both unprofitable and unsatisfactory, and he was wishing he could live it over again. The hot weather made him in indolent, and he had shirked his studies, tried Mr. Brooks' patience to the utmost, displeased his grandfather by practicing half the afternoon, frightened the maid servants half out of their wits by mischievously hinting that one of his dogs was going mad, and after high words with the stableman about some fancied neglect of his horse, he had flung himself into his hammock." to fume over the stupidity of the world in general, till the peace of the lovely day quieted him in spite of himself. Staring up into the green gloom of the horse chestnut trees above him, he dreamed dreams of all sorts and was just imagining himself tossing on the ocean in a voyage around the world, when the sound of voices brought him ashore in a flash— Peeping through the meshes of the hammock, he saw the marches coming out, as if bound on some expedition. "'What in the world are those girls about now?' thought Lorry, opening his sleepy eyes to take, a look, to take a good look, for there was something rather peculiar in the appearance of his neighbors. Each wore a large flapping hat, a brown linen pouch slung over one shoulder, and carried a long staff. Meg had a cushion, Joe had a hook. Beth a dipper, and Amy a portfolio, all walked quietly through the garden out at the little back gate and began to climb the hill that lay between the house and the river. Well, that's cool, said Lorry to himself, to have a picnic and never ask me. They can't be going in the boat, for they haven't got the key. Perhaps they forgot it. I'll take it to them and see what's going on. 
though possessed of half a dozen hats. It took him some time to find one. Then there was the, a hunt for the key, which was at last discovered in his pocket, so that the girls were quite out of sight when he leapt the fence and ran after them. Taking the shortest way to the boathouse, he waited for them to appear, but no one came, and he went up the hill to take... The, to take an observation. A grove of pines covered one part of it, and from the heart of this green spot came a clearer sound than the soft sigh of the pines or the drowsy chirp of the crickets. Here's a landscape, thought Lorry, peeping through the bushes and looking wide awake and good-natured already. It was rather a pretty little picture, for the sisters sat together in the shady nook with sun and shadow flickering over them, the aromatic wind lifting their hair and cooling their hot cheeks, and all the little wood people going on with their affairs as if these were no strangers but old friends. Mag sat Meg. Meg sat upon her cushion. We watched a movie with someone named Maggie in it earlier, so maybe I was in there. Meg sat upon her cushion, sewing daintily with her white hands and looking as fresh and sweet as a rose in her pink dress among the green. Beth was sorting the cones that lay thick under the hemlock nearby, for she made pretty things of them. Amy was sketching a group of ferns, and Joe was knitting as she read aloud. A shadow passed over the boy's face as he watched them, feeling that he ought to go, because uninvited yet yet lingering because home seemed very lonely and this quiet party in the woods most attractive to his restless spirit. He stood so still that a squirrel, busy with its harvesting, ran down a pine close beside him, saw him suddenly, and skipped back, scolding so shrilly that Beth looked up, espied the wistful face behind the birches, and beckoned with a reassuring smile. "'May I come in, please, or shall I be a bother?' he asked, advancing slowly. Meg lifted her eyebrows, but Joe scowled at her defiantly and said at once, "'Of course you may. We should have asked you before, only we thought you wouldn't care for such a girl's game as this. I always like your game, but if Meg don't want me, I'll go away. I've no objection if you do something. It's against the rule to be idle here.' replied Meg, gravely but graciously. Much obliged. I'll do anything if you'll let me stop a bit, for it's as dull as the desert of Sahara down there. Shall I sew, read, cone, draw, or do all at once? Bring on your bears. I'm ready, said Lori, er, and Lori sat down with the submissive expression delightful to behold. Finish this story while I set my heel, said Joe, handing him the book. Yes, um, was the meek answer as he began, doing his best to prove his gratitude for the favor of an admission into the Busy Bee Society. The story was not a long one, and when it was finished, he ventured to ask a few questions as a reward of merit. Please, mum, could I inquire of this highly instructive and charming institution is a new one? Would, it, would you tell him? asked Meg of her sisters. He'll laugh, said Amy warningly. "'Who cares?' said Joe. "'I guess he'll like it,' added Beth. "'Of course I shall. I give you my word I won't laugh. "'Tell away, Joe, and don't be afraid. "'The idea of being afraid of you? "'Well, you see, we used to play Pilgrim's Progress, "'and we have been going on, it with in, going on with it in earnest all winter and summer.' "'Yes, I know,' said Laurie, nodding wisely. "'Who told you?' demanded Joe. "'Spirits.' "'No, it was me.' I wanted to amuse him one night when you were all away, and he was rather dismal. He did like it, so don't scold, Joe, said Beth meekly. You can't keep a secret. Never mind. It saves trouble now. Go on, please, said Laurie, as Joe became absorbed in her work, looking a trifle displeased. Oh, didn't she tell you about this new plan of ours? Well, we have tried not to waste our holiday, but each has had a task and worked at it with, with a will. The vacation is nearly over, the stints are all done, and we are ever so glad that we didn't dawdle. Yes, I should think so, said Laurie, or and Laurie thought regretfully of his own idle days. Mother likes to have us out of the door as much as possible, so we bring our work here and have nice times. For the fun of it, we bring our things 
in these bags where old hats use poles to climb the hill and play pilgrims as we used to do years ago. We call this hill the Delectable Mountain for we can look far away and see the country where we hope to live sometime. Joe pointed and Laurie sat, sat up to examine for though for through an opening in the wood, one could look across the wide blue river, the meadows on the other side, far over the outskirts of the great city, to the green hills that rose to meet the sky. The sun was low, and the heavens glowed with the splendor of an autumn sunset. Gold and purple clouds lay on the hilltops, and rising high into the ruddy light were silvery white peaks that shone like the airy spires of some celestial city. "'How beautiful that is,' said Laurie softly, "'for he was quick to see and feel beauty of any kind. "'It's often so, and we like to watch it, "'for it is never the same, but always splendid,' "'replied Amy, wishing she could paint it. "'Joe talks about the country where we hope to live sometime, "'the real country, she, mean, she means, with pigs and chickens and haymaking. "'It would be nice, but I wish the beautiful country up there was real, "'and we could we could ever go to it, said Beth, musingly. There is a lovelier country even than that where we shall go by and by when we are good enough, answered Meg with her sweet voice. It seems so long to wait, so hard to do. I want to fly away at once as those swallows fly and go in at that splendid gate. You'll get there, Beth, sooner or later. No fear of that, said Joe. I'm the one that will have to fight and work and climb and wait and maybe never get in after all. You'll have me for company, if that's any comfort. I shall have to deal, have to do a deal of traveling before I come in sight of your celestial city. If I arrive late, you'll say a good word for me, won't you, Beth? Something in the boy's face troubled his little friend, but she said cheerfully with her quiet eyes on the changing clouds, If people really want to go and really try all their lives, I think they will get in, for I don't believe there are any locks on that door or any guards at the gate. I always imagine it is as it is in the picture where the shining ones stretch out their hands to welcome poor Christian as he comes up from the river. Wouldn't it be fun if all the castles in the air which we make could come true and we live in them and we could live in them, said Joe after a little pause. I've made such quantities it would be hard to choose which, I've, which I'd have, said Laurie, lying flat and throwing cones at the squirrel who had betrayed him. You'd have to take your favorite one. What is it? asked Meg. If I tell you mine, will you tell, will you tell yours? Yes, if the girls will, too. We will. Now, Laurie, after I'd seen as much of the world as I want to, I'd like to settle in Germany and have just as much music as I choose. I'm to be a famous musician myself, and all creation is to rush to hear, and I'm never to be bothered about money or business, but just enjoy myself and live for what I like. That's my favorite castle. What's yours, Meg? I'm going to pause right there just one second because Lori wanted to live in Germany, and I find that peculiar because the unification of Germany came after the French and German War in 19 or 1870, and this book was published originally. Do, 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 do. I'm not sure. I would have to look it up. I thought it was in the 1860s, though. 1868. Yes, so that is interesting, but I guess it was already commonly called Germany. Um, more to follow. Very interesting. Now I will continue. Margaret seemed to find it a little hard to tell hers and moved a break before her face as if to disperse imaginary gnats while she said slowly, I should like a lovely house full of all sorts of luxurious things, nice food, pretty clothes, handsome furniture, pleasant people, and heaps of money. I am to be mistress of it and manage it if I like, with plenty of servants, so I never need work a bit. How I should enjoy it, for I wouldn't be idle, but do good, and make everyone love me dearly. "'Wouldn't you have a master for your castle in the air?' asked Laurie slyly. "'I said pleasant people, you know,' said Meg carefully, tied up, um, and Meg carefully tied up her shoe as she spoke, so that no one saw her face. 
Why don't you say you'd have a splendid, wise, good husband and some angelic little children? You know, your castle wouldn't be perfect without, said Blunt Joe, who had no tender fancies yet and rather scorned romance except in books. You'd have nothing but horses, inkstands, and novels in yours, answered Meg petulantly. Wouldn't I, though? I'd have a stable full of Arabian steeds, rooms piled with books, and I'd write out of a magic inkstand so that so that my works should be as famous as Laurie's music. I want to do something splendid before I go into my castle, something heroic or wonderful. That won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I don't know what, but I'm on the watch for it and mean to astonish you all some day. I think I shall write books and get rich and famous. That would suit me, so that is my favorite dream." Mine is to stay home safe with father and mother and help take care of the family, said Beth contentedly. Don't you wish for anything else? asked Laurie. Since I had my little piano, I am perfectly satisfied. I only wish we, we may all keep well and be together, nothing else. I have lots of wishes, but the pet one is to be an artist and go to Rome and do fine pictures and be the best artist in the whole world, was Amy's modest desire. We're an ambitious set, aren't we? Every one of us but Beth wants to be rich and famous and gorgeous in every respect. I do wonder if any of us will ever get our wishes, said Laurie, chewing grass like a meditative calf. I've got the key to my castle in the air, but whether I can unlock the door remains to be seen, observed Joe mysteriously. I've got the key to mine, but I'm not allowed to try it. Hang college, muttered Laurie with an impatient sigh. "'Here's mine,' and Amy waved her pencil. "'I haven't got any,' said Meg, forlornly. "'Yes, you have,' said Laurie at once. "'Where?' "'In your face.' "'Nonsense. That's of no use. "'Wait, and see if it doesn't bring you something worth having,' "'replied the boy, laughing at the thought of a charming little secret "'which he fancied he knew. "'Meg colored behind the brake, but asked no questions, "'and looked across the river with the same expectant expression "'which Mr. Brooke had worn when he told the story of the night. "'If we are all alive ten years hence, "'let's meet and see how many of us have got our wishes "'or how much nearer we are them than now,' said Joe, "'and always ready with a plan. "'Bless me, how old shall I be? Twenty-seven? exclaimed Meg, who felt grown up already, having just reached seventeen. You and I shall be twenty-six, Teddy, Beth twenty-four, and Amy twenty-two. What a venerable party, said Joe. I hope I shall have done something to be proud of by that time, but I'm such a lazy dog, I'm afraid I shall dawdle, Joe. You need a motive, Mother says, and when you get it, she is sure you'll work splendidly. Is she? By Jupiter, I will, if only I get the chance, cried Laurie, sitting up with sudden energy. I ought to be satisfied to please Grandfather, and I do try, but it's working against the grain, you see, and comes hard. He wants me to be an India merchant, as he was, and I'd rather be... I'd rather be shot. I hate tea and silk and spices and every sort of rubbish his old ships bring, and I don't care how soon they go to the bottom when I own them. Going to college ought to satisfy him, for if I give him four years, he ought to let me off from the business. But he's set. I've got to do just as he did, unless I break away and please myself as my father did. If there was anyone left to stay with the old gentleman, I'll, I'd do it tomorrow. Laurie spoke excitedly and looked ready to carry his threat into execution on the slightest provocation, for he was growing up very fast, and in spite of his indolent ways, had a young man's hatred of subjection, a young man's restless longing to try the world for himself. I advise you to sail away in one of your ships and never come home again until you've tried your own way, said Joe, whose imagination was fired by the thought of such a daring exploit, and whose sympathy was excited by what she called Teddy's wrongs. That's not right, Joe. You mustn't talk in that way, and Laurie mustn't take your bad advice. You should just do what your grandfather wishes, my dear boy, said Meg in her most maternal tone. Do your best at college, and when he sees that you try and please him, 
and when he sees that you try to please him, I'm sure he won't be hard or unjust to you. As you say, there is no one else to stay with and love him, and you'd never forgive yourself if you left him without his permission. Don't be dismal or fret, How? Um, but, but do your duty, and you'll get your reward, as good Mr. Brooke has by being respected and loved." "'What do you know about him?' asked Laurie, grateful for the good advice, but objecting to the lecture, and glad to turn the conversation from himself after his unusual outbreak. "'Only what your grandpa told mother about him, how he took good care of his own mother till she died, and wouldn't go abroad as tutor to some nice person, because he wouldn't leave her, and how he provides now for an old woman who nursed his mother and never tells anyone, but is just as generous and patient and good as he can be. "'So he is, dear fellow.' A dear old fellow, said Laurie heartily, as Meg paused, looking flushed and earnest with her story. It's like Grandpa to find out all about him without letting him know, and to tell all his goodness to others, so that they might like him. Brooke couldn't understand why your mother was so kind to him, asking him over with me, and treating him in her beautiful, friendly way. He thought she was just perfect and talked about it for days and days and went on about you all in flaming style. If ever I do get my wish, you see what I'll do for Brooke. Begin to do something now by not plaguing his life out, said Meg sharply. How do you know I do, miss? I can always tell by his face when he goes away. If you have been good, he looks satisfied and walks briskly. If you have plagued him, he's sober and walks slowly, as if he wanted to go back and do his work better. Well, I like that. So you keep an account of my good and bad marks on Brooke's face, do you? I see him bow and smile as he passes your window, but I didn't know you'd got up a telegraph. We haven't, and don't be angry, and, oh... Don't tell him I said anything. It was only to show that I cared how you, get, how you get on. And what is said here is said in confidence, you know, cried Meg, much alarmed at the thought of what might follow from her careless speech. I don't tell tales, replied Laurie, with his high and mighty air, as Joe called a certain expression which he occasionally wore. Only if Brooke is going to be a thermometer, I must mind and have fair weather for him to report. Please don't be offended. I didn't mean to preach or tell tales or be silly. I only thought Joe was encouraging you in a feeling which you'd be sorry for by and by. You are so kind to us. We feel as if you were our brother and say just what we think. Forgive me. I meant it kindly. And Meg offered her hand with a gesture both affectionate and timid. Ashamed of his momentary pique, Laurie squeezed the kind little hand and said frankly i'm the one to be forgiven i'm cross and have have been out of sorts all day i like to have you tell me all my faults and be sisterly so don't mind if i am grumpy sometimes i thank you all the same Bent on showing that he was not offended, he made himself as agreeable as possible, wound cotton for Meg, recited poetry to please Joe, shook down cones for Beth, and helped Amy with her ferns, proving himself a fit person to belong to the Busy Bee Society. In the midst of an animated discussion on the domestic habits of turtles, one of which amiable creatures having strolled up from the river, the faint sound of a bell warned them that Hannah had put the tea to draw, and they would just have time to get home to supper. "'May I come again?' asked Laurie. "'Yes, if you are good, and love your book as the boys in the primer are told to do,' said Meg, smiling." I'll try. Then you may come, and I'll teach you to knit as the Scotchmen do. There's a demand for socks just now, added Joe, waving hers like a big blue worsted banner as they parted at the gate. That night, when Beth played to Mr. Lawrence in the twilight, Laurie, standing in the shadow of the curtain, listened to the little David, whose simple music always quieted his moody spirit, and watched the old man, who sat with his gray head on his hand, thinking tender thoughts of the dead child he had loved so much. Remembering the com conversation of the afternoon, the boy said to himself, with the resolve to make the sacrifice cheerfully, 
I'll let my castle go and stay with the dear old gentleman while he needs me, for I am all he has. And that's the end of chapter 13. Let's go through the pictures. This is a still life, an example of May's mature artistic talent. So that was one of her paintings, I guess. And let's see. May Alcott decorated a panel at Orchard House with this painting. And here is uh, Christian. This is from uh, Pilgrim's Progress, is aided by the Shining Ones in this illustration from one of Bronson's personal copies. And here is, this is um, Lori sleeping in a hammock. So those are the pictures that I had for chapter 13. So let's go on to chapter 14, which is called Secrets. Chapter 14, Secrets. Joe was very busy in the garret, for the October days began to grow chilly, and the afternoons were short. For two or three hours, the sun lay warmly in, the, in at the high window, showing Joe seated on the old sofa, writing busily with her papers spread out upon a trunk before her, while Scrabble, the pet rat, promenaded the beams overhead, accompanied by his eldest son, a fine young fellow who was evidently very proud of his whiskers. Quite absorbed in her work, Joe scribbled away till the last page was filled when she signed her name with a flourish and threw down her pen, exclaiming, "'There, I've done my best!' If this don't suit, I shall have to wait till I can do better. Lying back on the sofa, she read the manuscript carefully through, making dashes here and there and putting in many exclamation points, which looked like little balloons. Then she tied, up, tied it up with a smart red ribbon and sat a minute looking at it with a sober, wistful expression, which plainly showed how earnest her work had been. Joe's desk up here was an old tin kitchen, which hung against the wall. In it, she kept her papers and a few books safely shut away from Scrabble, who, being likewise of a literary turn, was fond of making a circulating library of such books as it were left in his way by eating the leaves. From this tin receptacle, Joe produced another manuscript, and putting both in her pocket, crept quietly down the stairs, leaving her friends to nibble her pens and taste her ink. She put on her hat and jacket as, as noiselessly as possible, and, going to the back entry window, got out upon the roof of a low porch, swung herself down to the grassy bank, and took a roundabout way to the road. Once there, she composed herself, hailed a passing omnibus, and rolled away to town, looking very merry and mysterious. If anyone had been watching her, he would have thought her movements de decidedly peculiar, for on alighting she went off at a great pace till she reached a certain number in a certain busy street, having found the place with some difficulty. She went into the doorway, looked up the dirty stairs, and after standing stock still a minute, suddenly dived into the streets and walked away as rapidly as she came. The maneuvers she repeated several times to the great amusement of a great, sorry, of a black-eyed young gentleman. I don't know where I got great. I'm going to start the sentence over. This maneuver she repeated several times to the great amusement of a black-eyed young gentleman lounging in the window of a building opposite. On returning for the third time, Joe gave herself a shake, pulled her hat over her eyes, and walked up the stairs, looking as if she was going to have all her teeth out. 
There was a dentist sign, among others, which adorned the entrance, and after staring a moment at the pair of artificial jaws which slowly opened and shut to draw attention to a fine set of teeth, the young gentleman put on his coat, took his hat, and went down to post himself in the opposite doorway, saying, with a smile and a shiver, "'It's like her to come alone, but if she has a bad time, she'll need someone to help her home.' In ten minutes, Joe came running downstairs with a very red face and a, the general appearance of a person who had just passed through a trying ordeal of some sort. When she saw the young gentleman, she looked anything but pleased and passed him with a nod, but he followed, asking with an air of sympathy, "'Did you have a bad time?' "'Not very.' "'You got through quick?' "'Yes, thank goodness.' "'Why did you go alone?' "'Didn't want anyone to know.' You're the oddest fellow I ever saw. How many did you have out? Joe looked at her friend as if she did not understand him, then began a laugh, began to laugh, as if mightily amused at something. There are two which I want to have come out, but I must wait a week. What are you laughing at? You are up to some mischief, Joe, said Laurie, looking mystified. So are you. "'What are you doing, sir, up in that billiard salon?' "'Begging your pardon, ma'am, it wasn't a billiard salon, but a gymnasium, "'and I was taking a lesson in fencing.' "'I'm glad of that. Why? You can teach me, and then we can play Hamlet. "'You can be Laertes, and we will make a fine thing of the fencing scene.' "'Lory burst out with a hearty boy's laugh, which made several passers-by smile in spite of themselves.' I'll teach you whether we play Hamlet or not. It's grand fun, and we'll straighten you up capitally. But I don't believe that was your only reason for saying I'm glad in that decided way, was it now? No, I was glad you were not in the salon, because I hope you never go to such places, do you? Not often. I wish you wouldn't. It's no harm, Joe. I have billiards at home, but it's no fun unless you have good players, so as I'm not fond... So as I'm fond of it, I come sometimes and have a game with Ned Moffat or some of the other fellows. Oh dear, I'm so sorry. If you'll get to liking it better and better and we'll waste time and money and grow like those dreadful boys, I did hope you'd stay respectable and be, sat be a satisfaction to your friends, said Joe, shaking her head. Can't a fellow take a little innocent amusement now and then without losing his respectability, asked Laurie, looking nettled. That depends on how and where he takes it. I don't like Ned and his sort, and wish you'd keep out of it. Mother won't let us have him at our house, though he wants to come, and if you grow like him, she won't be willing to have us frolic together as we do now. Won't she? asked Laurie anxiously. No, she can't bear fashionable young men, and she'd shut us all up in bandboxes rather than have us associate with them. Well... She needn't get out her bandboxes yet. I'm not a fashionable party, and I don't mean to be, but I do like harmless larks now and then, don't you? Yes, nobody minds them. So lark away, but don't get wild, will you? Or there will be an end of all our good times. I'll be a, I'll be a double distilled saint. I can't bear saints. Just a simple, honest, respectable boy, and we'll never desert you. I don't know what I should do if you acted like Mr. King's son. He had plenty of money, but didn't know how to spend it, and got tipsy and gambled and ran away and forged his father's name, I believe, and was altogether horrid. You think I'm likely to do the same? Much obliged. No, I don't. Oh, dear, no. But I hear people talking about money being such a temptation, and I sometimes wish you were poor. I shouldn't worry, then. Do you worry about me, Joe? A little, when you look moody or discontented, as you sometimes do, for you've got such a strong will if you once get started wrong, I'm afraid it would be hard to stop you. Laurie walked in silence a few minutes, and Joe watched him, wishing she had held her tongue, for her, his eyes looked angry, though his lips still smiled as if at her warnings. "'Are you going to deliver lectures all the way home?' he asked presently. "'Of course not. Why?' "'Because if you are, I'll take a bus if you aren't. Um, "'If you are not, 
I'd like to walk with you and tell you something very interesting. I won't preach any more, and I'd like to hear the news immensely. Very well, then. Come on. It's a secret, and if I tell you, you must tell me yours. I haven't got any, began Jo, but stopped suddenly, remembering that she had. You know you have. You can't hide anything, so up and fess, or I won't tell, cried Lori. Is your secret a nice one? Oh, isn't it? All about people you know, and such fun. You ought to hear it, and I've been aching to tell this long time. Come, you begin. You'll not say anything about, about it at home, will you? Not a word. And you won't tease me in private. I never tease. Yes, you do. You get everything you want out of people. I don't know how you do it, but you are a born wheedler. Thank you. Fire away. Well... I've left two stories with a newspaper man, and he's to give his answer next week, whispered Jo in her confidant's ear. Hurrah for Miss March, the celebrated American authoress, cried Laurie, throwing up his hat and catching it again, to the great delight of two ducks, four cats, five hens, and a half dozen Irish gentlemen, for, sorry, Irish children, excuse me, weird, for they were out of the city now. Hush! It won't come to anything, I dare say, but I couldn't rest till I had tried, and I said nothing about it, because I didn't want anyone else to be disappointed. It won't fail. Why, Joe, your stories are works of Shakespeare compared to half the rubbish that's published every day. Won't it be fun to see them in print, and shan't we feel proud of our authoress? Joe's eyes sparkled, for it's always pleasant to be believed in, and a friend's praise is always sweeter than a dozen newspaper puffs. Where's your secret? Play fair, Teddy, or I'll never believe you again, she said, trying to extinguish the brilliant hopes that blazed up at, at a word of encouragement. I may get into a scrape for telling, but I didn't promise, I didn't promise not to, so I will. For I never feel easy in my mind till I've told you any plummy bit of news I get. I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all? said Joe, looking disappointed, as Laurie nodded and twinkled with a face full of mysterious intelligence. It's quite enough for the present, as you'll agree when I tell you where it is. Tell them. Lori bent and whispered three words in Joe's ear, which produced a comical change. She stood and stared at him for a minute, looking both surprised and displeased, then walked on, saying sharply, "'How do you know?' "'Saw it.' "'Where?' "'Pocket.' "'All this time?' "'Yes. Isn't that romantic?' "'No, it's horrid!' "'Don't you like it?' "'Of course I don't. It's ridiculous.' It won't be allowed. My patience, what would Meg say? You are not to tell anyone, mind that. I didn't promise. That was understood, and I trusted you. Well, I won't for the present anyway, but I'm disgusted and wish you hadn't told me. I thought you'd be pleased. At the idea of anybody coming to take Meg away? No, thank you. You'll feel better about it when somebody comes to take you away. I'd like to see any one of you try it, or any one try it, cried Joe fiercely. So should I, and Laurie chuckled at the idea. I don't think secrets agree with me. I feel rumpled up in my mind since you told me that, said Joe, rather ungratefully. Race down this hill with me and you'll be all right, suggested Laurie. No one was in sight. The smooth road sloped invitingly before her, and, finding the temptation irresistible, Joe darted away, soon leaving hat and comb behind her and scattering hairpins as she ran. Lori reached the goal first and was quite satisfied with the success of his treatment, for his Atlanta came panting up with flying hair, bright eyes, ruddy cheeks, and no signs of dissatisfaction in his face." In her face. Um, so, there is a note on Atlanta, because I was really confused by that word, but this is the note. It says it is misspelled here, so it's not a city in Georgia. Misspelled here by either Alcott or her editors, Atalanta was an athletic girl in Greek mythology who would consent to marry only the suitor who could defeat her in a foot race. So that is the illusion that is being portrayed here in this scene. 
I wish I was a horse, then I could run for miles in this splendid air and not lose my breath. It was capital, but see what a guy's what a guy it's made me. Go pick up my things like a cherub you, as you are, said Joe, and uh, dropping down under the maple trees, which was carpeting the bank with crimson leaves. Lori leisurely departed to recover the lost property, and Joe bundled up her braids, hoping no one would pass by till she was tidy again. But someone did pass, and who should it be but Meg, looking particularly ladylike in her state and festival suit, for she had been making calls, probably on her cell phone. Um, what in the world are you doing here, she asked, regarding her disheveled sister with well-bred surprise. Getting leaves, meekly answered Joe, sorting the rosy handful she had just swept up. And hairpins, added Laurie, throwing half a dozen into Joe's lap. They grow on this road, Meg. So do combs and brown straw hats. You've been running, Joe. How could you? When will you stop such romping ways, said Meg reprovingly, as she settled her cuffs and smoothed her hair with which the wind had taken liberties. Never till I'm stiff and old and have to use a crutch. Don't try to make me grow up before my time, Meg. It's hard enough to have you change all of a sudden. Let me be a little girl as long as I can. As she spoke, Joe bent over her work to hide the trembling of her lips, for lately she had felt that Margaret was fast getting to be a woman, and Laurie's secret made her dread the separation which must surely come some time and now seemed very near. He saw the trouble in her face and drew Meg's attention from it by asking quickly, "'Where have you been calling all so fine?' "'At, at the Gardeners and... Sally has been telling me all about Bell Moffat's wedding. It was very splendid, and they have gone to spend the winter in Paris. Just think how delightful that must be. Do you envy her, Meg? said Laurie. I'm afraid I do. I'm glad of it, muttered Joe, tying on her hat with a jerk. Why? asked Meg, looking surprised. Because if you care much about riches, you will never go and marry a poor man, said Joe frowning at Laurie, who was mutely warning her to mind what she said. "'I shall never go and marry anyone,' observed Meg, wa walking on with great dignity while the others followed, laughing, whispering, skipping stones, and behaving like children, as Meg said to herself, though she might have been tempted to join them if she had not had her best dress on. For a week or two, Joe behaved so queerly that her sisters got quite bewildered. She rushed to the door when the postman rang, was rude to Mr. Brooke whenever they met, would sit looking at Meg with a woe-begone face, occasionally jumping up to shake, and then to kiss her in a very mysterious manner. Lori and she were always making signs to one another and talking about spread eagles till the girls declared that they had both lost their wits. On the second Saturday, after Joe got out of the window, Meg, as she sat sewing at her window, was scandalized by the sight of Laurie chasing Joe all over the garden and finally capturing her in Amy's, uh, Amy's bower. What went on there... Meg could not see, but shrieks of laughter were heard, followed by the murmur of voices and a great flapping of newspapers. "'What shall we do with that girl? She never will behave like a young lady,' sighed Meg as, um, as she watched the race with a disapproving face. "'I hope she won't. She is so funny and dear as she is,' said Beth." who had never betrayed that she was a little hurt at Joe's having secrets with anyone but her. It's very trying, but we shall never make her comme, comme la faux, added Amy, who, was, who sat making some new frills for herself with her curls tied up in a very becoming way, two agreeable things which made her feel unusually elegant and ladylike. In a few minutes, Joe bounced in, laid herself on the sofa, and affected to read. "'Have you anything interesting there?' asked Meg, with condescension. "'Nothing but a story. Don't amount to much, I guess,' returned Joe, returned Joe, carefully keeping the name of the paper out of sight. 
"'You'd better read it out loud. That will amuse us and keep you out of mischief,' said Amy in her most grown-up tone. "'What's the name?' asked Beth, wondering why Joe kept her face behind the sheet. "'The Rival Painters. That sounds very well. Read it,' said Meg. With a loud hem and a long breath, Joe began to read very fast." The girls listened with interest, for the tale was romantic and somewhat pathetic, as most of the characters died in the end. Ha <laughs> ha, my kind of story. Um, I like that about the splendid I like that about the splendid picture was Amy's approving remark as Joe paused. I prefer the love lovering part. Viola and Angelo are two of our favorite names. Isn't that queer, said Meg, wiping her eyes, for the lovering part was tragical. Who wrote it? asked Beth, who had caught a glimpse of Joe's face. The reader suddenly sat up, cast away the paper, displaying a flushed countenance, and with a funny mixture of solemnity and excitement, replied in a loud voice, Your sister. You? cried Meg, dropping her work. It's very good, said Meg, critically. <coughs> I knew it, I knew it. Oh, my Joe, I am so proud, said Beth. And she ran to hug her sister and exult over this splendid success. Dear me, how delighted they all were, to be sure, how Meg wouldn't believe it till she saw the words Miss Josephine March actually printed in the paper. How graciously Amy criticized the artistic parts of the story and offered hints for a sequel which unfortunately couldn't be carried out as the hero and heroine were dead. How Beth got excited and skipped and sung with joy. How Hannah came in to exclaim, Sakes alive! Well, I never! In great astonishment at that Joe's doins. How proud Miss March was when she knew it. How Joe laughed with tears in her eyes as she declared she might as well be a peacock and done with it. And how the spread eagle might be said to flap his wings triumphantly over the house of March. As the paper passed from hand to hand, tell us about it. When did it come? How much did you get for it? What will father say? Won't Lori laugh? cried the family, all in one breath, as they clustered about Joe. For these foolish, affectionate people made a jubilee of every little household joy. Stop jabbering, girls, and I'll tell you everything, said Joe, wondering if, if Miss Burney felt any grander over her Evelina than she did over her rival painters. Having told how she disposed of her tales, Joe added, and when I went to get my answer, the man said he liked them both, but didn't pay beginners, only let them print in his paper, and noticed the stories. It was good practice, he said, and when the beginners improved, anyone would pay. So I let him have the two stories, and today this was sent to me, and Laurie caught me with it and insisted on seeing it, so I let him, and he said it was good, and I shall write more, and he's going to get the next the next paid for, and oh, I am so happy, for in time I may be able to support myself and help the girls. Joe's breath gave out here, and wrapping her head in the paper, she bedewed her little story with a few natural tears, for to be independent and earn the praise of those she loved were the dearest wishes of her heart, and this seemed to be the first step, step toward that happy end. That is the end of chapter 14. Chapter 15 is called A Telegram, and the first word is November. Um, we're going to go back and do the pictures from the last chapter. Here is where she's reading the paper. Do, 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 do. And here is a... This is um, the race between Hippomenes and Atalanta, painted in the 1760s, and we may have seen it when we visited the Louvre, because that's where it is. I don't remember seeing it, but we may have passed by it. Um, that is a large museum in Paris. Very, very large. This is a especially popular omnibus. So this is what a bus might have looked like in uh, Louisa May Alcott's time. 
and 2005 Broadway musical adaptation of Little Women. Here is, I'm assuming that's Joe. And here is Joe writing her story. And here's the tin kitchen, which is where she kept her story to keep the, was it the rat? Yeah, the pet that would, rat. The pet rat that would eat the, the pages. All right, and that's all the pictures that we have today. I hope that you're enjoying this story. Um, oh, and once again, the next chapter is called A Telegram, chapter 15. We will do that one next time. Uh, God willing, it will be tomorrow. And we will see you then. God bless you. Have a great night. Thanks.